Hi, I'm John Atak, and here we are again with Karen de la Carrière. How wonderful. Hi, Karen. John, John, I'm so thrilled at the acknowledgement you were given by Eton University. It's Eton College. They're not quite in <laughs> Eton College. Yep. But who, what a history, built how long ago? It was... Uh, Endowed by uh, Henry VI in uh, 1440, when their chapel and the original part of the school was built. Um, I think it would be fair to say that it is the most prestigious school in the world. Um, what is the annual fee? <clears throat> on their website, £42,000 a year to send a boy there. For five years. Yeah, yeah they go for five years. So. Uh, and Windsor Castle, where the Queen lives, is a five-minute walk. That's right. And, and indeed, um, of course, Prince Charles went to Eton. Prince Harry, Prince William went to Eton. Um, so, you know, and <clears throat> when I got there, we, we had a tour of the place. And, uh, and they invite you to come and speak on Scientology? Yeah. that, that um, I just thought it was because, you know, I have the good fortune to have a friend who sends his son there, and he suggested that I talk there and and I was sort of oh, I'll talk about how to spot fake news or something like that because I'm quite interested in that and um, you know Google and Facebook don't seem to have been very useful in their advice about it um, and um, the English tutor who, who contacted me came out and he said well would you mind talking about the perils of investigating Scientology to the, the perils of investigating Scientology Eaton mm -hmm. wanted to know about yeah for the, the Journalism Society at Eton. And um, I, yeah. I should also say that they there are just over a thousand boys there. Um, there's this idea that um, anybody can pay the money and they go there. There is an entrance exam. They have to pass that. And about, they're getting to the point where they've got nearly 10% of the boys are actually on scholarship. Mm -hmm. And they pay 110% scholarship. So you not only have all of your fees covered, they they are given enough money so they'll be able to, you know, survive in the Eton oh, environment, exactly. go to the tuck shop and that kind of thing. Um, but it, it it was fascinating because I, I I have found I've had a couple of uh, people that I've dealt with who, who'd gone to what we call for some reason public schools, which are these private schools, and they were really difficult. You know the people who'd been institutionalised in these places um, were, were really being prepared to join other authoritarian groups. And I sort of thought, well, probably by now that's changed a lot. And it has. The, the boys that I met and the questions I was asked after, after giving the talk, it's very intelligent. There, there's a lot of thought going on here. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm hopeful because, yes, this is where, you know, African potentates and um, rich Arabs and some Russian oligarchs. And uh, it's worth saying that they'd had a demonstration supporting the Ukraine uh, Ooh, two weeks before I nice. came along. So, and, you know, there was this, somebody put this thought to me that, you know, the children of Russian oligarchs would have to be suspended because they can't pay the fees. They don't have any children of Russian oligarchs. So oh. that was all good. Um, but, but, People who will be very influential in politics, in, in commerce, some of these boys will inherit hundreds of millions of dollars. So the idea of getting the message over to, to them about dangerous authoritarian groups mm. is there's something especially pleasing about that. Mm. And doing it in an environment where you know Queen Victoria and George the Third used to, to hang out a great mm. deal and uh, they, they, we went into what is now the detention room, mm. and this is the original schoolroom from 1440. It mm. has these little fold-down benches, great long planks, and in front of them you have plank tables, and they are carved to almost nothing <laughs> over the centuries. You know, there are still wooden pillars supporting you know, the original structure. It, it was a trip. It was really quite remarkable and as you say how wonderful to be recognized by it's an honor it's an honor yeah. these are the academic minds of the future 
and you hear the phrase the old school Thai. Oh. Well, you know, <laughs> there's a certain <laughs> you came from that background. There's hmm. there's a cachet to it. Yeah. Yeah. And Absolutely. in terms of future favors or jobs and all that coming hmm. from that background. I did try and buy one of the ties, you know, so that I could, <laughs> but it didn't work. Old school tie mentality. Yeah. yeah. But so it, it's good and it, it's really good that such an institution would be interested in. Um, yeah. And that they knew, they knew that, you know, Scientology has a rotten, stinking reputation in the world. Um, maintain friendly relations with the public and the environment, as, as Aaron Hubbard said, but he, he was not capable of actually doing it. Yeah. Um, th their, you know, their reputation precedes them. So that talk, by the time this talk goes up, that talk will all already have gone up. We're now into a new system that um, we want to lift Spike out of poverty. You know, that's yeah. our mission now. Um, i take nothing from we've been doing this for three years now um i've been doing this for three years and spike the, the patreon money the paypal donations that goes to making sure that she can have the time because every hour that i sit around talking takes her about five hours to edit and, and get ready and uh so we started pushing this a couple of weeks ago and i'm happy to say that um our quantity of Patreons has gone up by 50% and our income mm -hmm. from Patreon has doubled in that wow. time. And we, we nearly have Spike lifted from um, abject poverty into dire poverty. Then we're hoping to get her into just regular poverty and, um, mm -hmm. in a few weeks. So what we're doing is, firstly, once a month, I'm going to do a, a Patreon q and I did the first one yesterday. Nice. Uh, and that be, should be up. Well, it will be up before this is. And that's just anybody who, who has put in a dollar or more a month can, can ask me questions and I will dodge them as best I can. Um, and, you know, and doing that once a month is good. It, it, was, it was good fun doing it yesterday. But we'll also, we're going to put videos up a week early for our Patreon people. So, um, you know, this, this video will, will, for a week, only people who've actually contributed something will, will be able to see it. And I'm hopeful. I mean, we've, we've, we've got, what, 3,340 subscribers, for which I'm very grateful. Um, but we've got very few Patreons. So if, you know, a dollar a month, five dollars, ten, what, whatever somebody can manage without it troubling them, would be useful and indeed if we can raise spike out of poverty i might even make a little money out of doing this you never know first yeah. time in my life um so that it, it, and i i actually got quite frustrated i got to this point where i said like, well why aren't people why don't people want me to do this you know they, it's it's great that they're subscribing it's great that you know particularly the videos that i do with you because you're such a star they will get five or ten or even fifteen thousand views but a lot of it's, you know, 500 to 1,000 views. I'm just saying, well, you know, I don't want to get into any L. Ron Hubbard nonsense about um, free service, free fall, the idea that if you don't give me money, you will go to hell. But you know, <laughs> it would be nice if, you know, people sort of went, well, I watched a video, I'll pay a dollar, you know, and uh, so four or five dollars a month for however much. And if, if and when that's flowing through, we'll be able to make, I'll be able to devote more time to this <clears throat> again, and, and we'll make much more sophisticated videos. I, I'm a huge fan of uh, Pomplamoose, the, the band, the, who are a duo, Jack Conti and, and Natalie Dawn. They make great videos. They just make pop song mashups. Probably I wouldn't listen to it if they didn't make wonderful videos with it. But Jack Conti, is also the founder of Patreon. So he's the CEO of a billion dollar company, having come from living in his, you know, in his old bedroom in his dad's house and making crazy animations and doing things. And I think it's a really inspiring thought that if you want something to persist in the world, you can put a few dollars in and uh, help to do that. So uh, 
we hope that uh, this will inspire people to rush out. <laughs> and uh, now that uh, we've realised that you have to put a Patreon button where people can find it, <laughs> uh, people should be able to uh, make some contribution if they'd like to. So there's a spiel. Please do. Yeah. Please, please do. <laughs> and you've come to me as ever, organised as ever, efficient as ever, with bullet points for us to talk about today. And I want, actually, there's something I want to ask you that came up in, in the Q&A yesterday. Somebody said, did I know anybody who had had their L processors, list 10, 11, and 12, supervised by Ron Hubbard? And um, see if I remember this right. Five people were trained by Hubbard to deliver the Ls. Otto Roast was one of them. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Um, do you yes. know who the, other, who the other four were in that group? That would be Quentin Hubbard. No. And that would be, I believe, Lisa Klingball. Yeah. Lisa Klingball. Um, let me think. Brian Livingston? I think Brian was my gen one generation just after the, yeah. the original Hubbard ones. Oh boy. Oh, if you'd asked me earlier, I go blank on certain names. Yeah, when it, when uh, it comes back uh, to you. Oh, uh, I'm thinking of a guy who fled and escaped. Um, and uh, it'll come back to you. Yeah, it'll come back. But, but, but did, did yeah, he actually. On the L's? Did he supervise? Question? Did he supervise anybody? I, I, rem you know, I remember Jay Hurwitz. Years ago, telling me that that he and Pamela, his wife to be, I think they met around that time, and they both were on the original L's, and uh, he's since completely left Scientology. I, I heard from him first time in twenty five years last year, uh, which was great because I really like Jay um, to tell me that you know he doesn't believe a word of it anymore. So, um, but but did Hubbard actually supervise any of the? Well, the, yes, because the ELS were a research project. Mm. They weren't thought of as some marketing ploy to sustain the flag land base. It turned into a commercial project, but it wasn't. Mm. The first L to be brought out into the civilization was because there was a guy called Bruce Welch. Of whom we have spoken. And L11 was this big, huge breakthrough where Hubbard said, guess what? Before one does evil, one forms an intention and vision in the mind to implement the plan you have devised to harm. So the big, the big major question on L11 is what evil purpose do you have? And why didn't anybody run this on Hubbard? <laughs> <laughs> this, this, is where, this is where I really, really was able to divest myself. Of. In Scientology, your strength and power is never enhanced. They don't look at your goodness and see how they can upgrade your abilities. That's what religion should do. And Hubbard talked about making the able more able, but able, in fact, but no, no. Scientology is the reverse. You evil, you spit out your evil, spit out your crimes, look inside and get your evil intentions. People, poor suckers that are on their prison program, re rehabilitation project force. For years, on every dynamic, they're looking for their evil called false purpose rundown, which yep. is a rundown to get your evil. Mm -hmm. 180 questions on each day. I, I, I don't know. So for years, five hours a day, you're made to look for your evil. And mm -hmm. this is therapy. This is, 
you you end up your self-esteem you 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 feel you are the biggest rogue in the universe not to mention one size fits all oh, you know, yeah. you, i sucks yeah. and you don't even have to be a man or a woman it's generic one size fits all yeah there, there are no individual differences between or, oh. right so scientology's one size fits all means you walk in you're gonna you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna get the rundowns and the processes to flush out your evil because guess what you've got evil to confess to there's when i did first interview Otto Rose, who was you know, one of the first class 12s. And um, with, he was Hubbard, he's actually the first person to do OTH um, back in about 1971 or something, just before he was thrown out. And the reason he was thrown out was uh, Hubbard had his annual winter illness. Um, yeah, he's, he'd um, get bronchitis, which I, I think um, smoking 100 cigarettes a day could have been involved with that, but no, I'm just guessing here. Um, but he, you know, the clearing course, OT3, this has finally cured his annual bronchitis, but he got it again. And um, so Otto said he gathered together every scrap of paper he could find that was a record of Hubbard's own auditing. And he said there were envelopes, there were all sorts, he got this massive paper and he went through it and did what's called a folder error summary um, to, to try and find out what had gone wrong. Now, Hubbard had come out with this idea that um, when the, the needle on an emitter goes crazy, it's called a rock slam. And originally in the 60s, this was that the, the thing that was holding you back and making everything dreadful in your life was called the rock. Something has now become an actor in Hollywood. It, it, something that's completely pushed aside in Scientology now, but it, it was an essential part in the early 60s. And the idea was that this needle going crazy, the rock slam, indicated that you'd found this thing. But then in the late 1960s, Hubbard changed his mind and he decided that the rock slam indicated that you had evil purposes. And indeed, I think almost half the crew in Florida were put onto the rehabilitation project force because a rock slam had been found in their folders. Well, what Otto found in going through Hubbard's folders was somewhere in the region of 200 rock slams. Now, these indicate evil purposes, according to Ron Hubbard. And so Otto confronted Hubbard with this and said, we have to deal with your evil purposes. And he ended up ashore with his passport and <laughs> no money and that was that was even gone um for, for daring to suggest that that ron hubbard had evil purposes and um well what can we say truth blows the lies away l ron hubbard said and in this case this incredible thought that scientology is an evil purpose it's the purpose of an individual to entrap and enslave other people um Men are my men are your slaves. Elemental beings are your slaves, as he wrote to himself. So, and that I think segues nicely in, into your first bullet point, which, which again is something that Otto and I talked about. Oh, in about 1984, 85, and I said to Otto, "It seems to me that that there is, you know, in fact, that Otto said to me that that that." Compassion was what was missing from Scientology. There was no compassion, that, that it avoids compassion. And I said, no, it doesn't just avoid it, it erodes it. It wears away compassion. And that brings us to the notion of love, which is essential to many, it's essential to any good and proper religion, the idea of compassion, the idea of empathy. Um, and Hubbard pushed us, there are no teachings about love. We, we hear about affinity, you know, how close you are willing to be to something, according to chemistry. And we, he do, we don't really have anything that, that takes us in a, in a direction, you know, like say Eric Fromm's wonderful book, The Art of Loving, which shows us that we, this is something we have to know how to do. 
Scientology doesn't have that, does it? Correct. Hmm. Ethics has supplanted love. Yes. The battle cry of Scientology is ethics, meaning punitive ethics, not ethics, although it's defined as the urge to survive, rah, rah, rah. No. An ethics particle, they've even got phrases where, ha, huh, he's an ethics. He's in ethics. Mm. Mean doesn't mean he's an ethical person in <laughs> living a life. In ethics means he's a the ethics officer about to be slammed for his secret dirt and his unworthy conduct. You mm. see, this is the deception of Scientology. Mm. How about prattle? Man is basically good. Man is basically good. However, it's even in it's even, it's even in the fundamental. Uh, if it's not in the axiom, it's in the create whatever. A man is basically good. Blah blah blah. Mm. But in Scientology, ninety percent of Scientology is looking for your evil, mm. your harm. It assumes, in fact, if you don't cough up enough, you're labeled a no overts case. That means you can't even confront your own evil. Yeah, you can't face it. No being able to even cough up a juicy enough crime, a no overts case. Now, after you've served Scientology 30, 40 years, 20 years, whatever, you're declared a suppressive person, mm. which means that after all, you were evil all along. They just didn't know about it. And they weren't any good at doing anything about it either. Exactly. So this hogwash, this hogwash of man is basically good. See, certain stuff looks good on paper, mm. but if man is basically good, Scientology doesn't go in the direction of raising that goodness, nurturing it, enhancing it, making you gooder than your original good. No, it cracks a whip to take you down, 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 back to the subject of love. There is no, there is no love in Scientology. There is no forgiveness. There is no kindness. These would be elements, sub components of love, forgiveness, benevolence, kindness, reaching out to nurture you, enhance you. Scientology is the reverse of that. Yes. And the longer you're in, the more the whip is cracked. It's like, come on, you're a vet. You should know better than that. We're going to, don't pretend this is all news to you. And the higher, look, look, look at what the execs had to endure, John, in mm. SP Hole. This is a nightmare confinement in a couple of rooms where. The double put, trailer. Double wide trailer. They had to sleep under their desk at night. We were permitted showers once a week and had to eat all of a twist, cold leftovers for food. This is the top absolute hierarchy mm. for a hundred of them. Talk about love. This was torture, supreme punishment. And Scientology's ideal, which Hubbard was no, Hubbard did not have charity. Hubbard didn't even love his wives. What man, he let Mary Sue be in jail for five years. Was it five years she was in? She, she was in for uh, just over a year, I think. But uh, they forgive on on. Well, the, I think the sentence got whatever. Yeah. Uh, they had a one to five. My little wife Sarah, he absolutely denied being married to her at all. Well, she I mean, married. after she came out of prison, and, and she, of course, signed a, a confession, which is more than 200 pages long, called a stipulation of evidence. And anybody who, who disbelieves what Scientology got up to in terms of its intelligence operations can read Mary Sue Hubbard's signed stipulation wow. of evidence. I've I heard, done that's it. That's an interesting And 
and where she confesses breaking and entering, kidnapping, false imprisonment, forging government credentials, theft of documents, all of this sort of stuff. But the reason she signed that was because they were saying, otherwise, we will keep investigating and we will catch your husband. We will get him. Mm-hmm. And she, so she went to prison to save him, that the deal was made that the 38 co-conspirators, um, including Kendrick Moxon, of course, the head of their legal department, uh, my dear friend Kendrick Moxon, um, and Elron Hubbard, they were named unindicted co-conspirators in, in these cases. Uh, cases, of course, which didn't just happen in the US, they happened in Canada, they happened in France, there were all sorts of awful intrigues going on and violations of human rights, violations of law. But she she loved him <clears throat> and yes. she gave up her own liberty to protect him. When she came out of prison, and I had this from somebody who was actually on the line where they were doing it, she kept writing to her husband and it would be passed along you know, through David Miscavige to Pat Broker and on. And Hubbard had given a directive that nothing negative, no N theta, could be passed to him. So they would photocopy the letters and take a razor blade and cut out anything negative, any complaint that she'd made. So I'm told that most of the letters read, Dear Ron, love Mary Sue. (laughs) All the content had been excised, you know. Um, and he never saw her again. He, he never saw her again, and uh, that was how much he cared. He didn't care about his children. Um, you know, he he basically tried to have his oldest son killed frequently. Uh, Aaron Hubbard Jr. was was targeted by horrific harassment. Um, his daughter Katie Gillespie, who we hear nothing about, she did do Scientology, but she didn't see her father. He had no time for her. Alexis, his daughter by his second bigamous marriage, um, he denied paternity. And the curiosity is that if you go back through the history of Scientology, the first, 1951, the second book that came out under his name, Science of Survival, is dedicated to Alexis Valerie Hubbard. Yes. Yes, I've and got- in 1971, he creates this scam and his own orders came out, the FBI raids, where she is told that he was not her father, but he felt so sorry for her mother that he took the poor pregnant mother in and looked after her. Now, Alexis uh, has red hair <laughs> and something like the facial fit. You know, this so he deny his own children. Uh, when Quentin died, and Quentin was much beloved. Um, everybody I've talked to who knew Quentin said, yeah, he was not an intellectual, but he was a kind-hearted young man uh, who wanted to fly aeroplanes and was gay. And um, when he died, a witness said that, that Hubbard just said, oh, you know, so, so we're going to get more bad public relations out of him yet again. Actually, Hubbard screamed in wrath and anger, look what he's done to me, when he heard of the death, that it was me, my yeah. image, me, yeah. me, me, me. Yeah. Not, there wasn't, I, 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 I'm shattered that I've lost a son. It was, look what he did, PR yeah. wife. Yeah, that was an eye-opener. But, but this is all Arthur because... Arthur and Suzette were, went, fell by the wayside. Diana's the only one of his children who's, who's still involved with Scientology. Yeah. And her daughter, Roanne, is not. She fled. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. you know, he, and he's, he, he just lived exactly as you say, for himself. He had no concern about anybody but himself. Well, this is subject literacy. The word love, the word love isn't something uh, that is part of Scientology. Punishment and ethics has supplanted love. The main doctrine of Scientology is 
Get your ethics in, you badass. Who's not? And because of the missing word and importance of the word understood conceptually, families are easily split up in Scientology. Mm. I mean, you've studied other religions, John, but in Scientology, you can be ordered just like that to divorce your mm. husband, divorce your wife, the ethics officer commands it, and people comply. Mm. Scientology is a love only me religion. Mm. Your prime affinity and obedience has to be the cult, not your spouse, not your family, the cult. They want absolute marriage to them, so to speak. And you know, they will even third, can you explain third party? It's, it's intervening and whispering uh, bad it, stuff. Uh, called, also called triangulation in the real world, the, the idea that that you say something about another person to somebody so that they will. So you might, for example, and it's a, used as an intelligence tactic in Scientology where they find your love and hate buttons and will then use them against you. So if they, for example, find out that you're homophobic, they will tell you your close friend is gay or has said you are gay or, you know, so this is third partying and it's, I, I, the wonderful John Hansen, I don't know if he's still with us, lovely bloke from New Zealand, mad as a hatter and, and quite quite a delight, I thought. But he said to me once, he said, how come it is that we've got the technology of third partying and we do more of it than anybody else? <laughs> yeah, ethics officers are renowned by getting a piece of scandalous data, even data from a confessional Mm. and informing the husband yep. of what the wife confessed to. Mm. Even if it was just a mental image picture of having an orgasm with someone else or some such. Oh, and the dreams. officer will tell each of the others dirt on the other mm. in a classic triangulation to have them split up. Mm. This occurs when they sense one or other of the spouses is drifting apart, drifting away. And Scientology doesn't have any qualm. It's considered the greatest good to ax that marriage. There's no love or caring for the children, how, the, how this would split up the family unit. I don't know of any other religion that kills marriages and orders divorces as much as Scientology. You got a comment? Yeah, I have. The, the, I, years ago, for 93 or something, I wrote a, a, a paper called um, Possible Origins for Dianetics and Scientology. Not the fanciest of, of titles, but it, it, it did the job. You can find it, it's, it's been posted on the web since then. And uh, it proved that, in fact, uh, a great amount of many of the ideas that would be formulated in Scientology came from Alistair Crowley. And I set about um, proving uh, Jeff Jacobson had written a very good paper showing that ideas that, that existed before Hubbard came along, that he'd use them. So I set to, to say, and he knew about them. So in each case, I'd prove a link to them. There was one curiosity that I and a fellow researcher who does not wish to be named got to, which was about the Rehabilitation Project Force. Because it seems to have come about when Hubbard was um, away from the ship, recovering from having smashed himself up in a motorcycle accident. Um, and he, we think, read um, Robert J. Lifton's book at that time um, which is about the thought reform camps in China um, where's it gone it's along here somewhere it's always always have a copy of Lifton handy um, yeah here we are uh, thought reform and the psychology of totalism which is the 
to understand authoritarian groups, his eight deadly sins of thought reform are an essential. But it seemed that the Rehabilitation Project Force was taking ideas from Mao Zedong mm. and from the re-education programme. And, you know, that was just a curiosity to us and we couldn't prove it. Um, I kept trying to, over the years, contact your friend Jim Dinkalsi and ask him, did he have this book at this time? And, and Jim would write back to me and say, who are you? <laughs> or what have you. So I never got an answer, sadly. But... Something else happened. I did a deep dive in, into Chinese brainwashing, Sinao, because I got sick and tired of sociologists saying there's no such thing as brainwashing. It's like, well, so what? That's what the Chinese called it. You know, are you saying they were wrong to call it that? And they'll say, oh, yeah, well, you see, it was Edward Hunter, who's this CIA guy. He invented the word. And you're going, no, he, he didn't. Sinao is Chinese. And it's the slang term used in China. It wasn't the official term, which is re-education, as they said in Xinjiang. These re-education camps. We're just educating them to not being Muslims anymore. Because um, all Muslims are terrorists. You know, some idea, some crazy idea. But in fact, um, Mao designed this program and he put about 200,000. I, I just got very interested in this and the history of it. Very little of which is known in the West. And let me say here that, in fact, it is a myth that Edward Hunter, the journalist, was the first person to use the word brainwashing in the English language. It is also a myth that he was a member of the CIA. He was a member of the OSS during World War II. But there's no evidence in the Hunter archive. You see how far I go to find these things out. There's no evidence that he was involved with the CIA. But he didn't come up with the term brainwashing anyway, even in English. I'm going to tell a secret here. The first time he first used it in September 1950, and he would later tell a story about this being because of prisoners of war um, in North Korea making up stories about America. Now, there weren't any prisoners of war. The Incheon Offensive happened that month. None of those statements were made. So that was a later deception that he made up. I get into tiny little details. It's just the way you, you live with Jeffrey. You know, he's the same, isn't he? We want to know what the small print says and why. Uh, in fact, the term brainwashing in, in English was first used in the Times of India in January 1950, long before he said it. And it was because, you know, October 49, Mao declares the People's Republic of China. Well, India is just you know, a year before that has become independent, and they're next door to each other. So their premier, Nehru, sent his brother-in-law to go and talk with Mao and see what happened. This group of these Indians were horrified by what they saw in China. And they came back, and one of them, writing an article, used the word brainwashing, which was then picked up. In studying, you know, brainwashing, is it possible to influence another human being? Can we educate people? Can we change people's minds? Is there such a thing as persuasion? Is there such a thing as persuading somebody to do something that's against their own best interests? It seems to me that these things are true. And so rather than just throwing something away and calling it brainwashing, and I came across a concept that stopped me in my tracks. What Mao Zedong did was he took the traditional Chinese view, Confucianism, mm. and he changed one thing in it. This has got nothing to do with Karl Marx or Lenin or anybody. It's Mao who devises this approach. The Chinese, as part of their culture, have absolute loyalty to the family. You have the same thing in Japan and Korea, that mm. that part of the world, you know, we're called individualistic, in the West, because we think of ourselves, uh, you know, whereas, you know, in, in Japan, if, if you've done something terrible, the only way you can cleanse the family name is by committing suicide, seppuku. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a very strong idea of, of the family and there's ancestor worship in um, Shinto in Japan and various of the Chinese um, groups and in Confucianism. And 
what Mao did was he displaced the family and replaced it with the party, the Communist Party. Mm -hmm. Now, what Hubbard did was displace the family and the loyalty that we absolutely should have to our families as long as they're not mean and dreadful people. Um, you know, I'm lucky. I, my family are lovely. But, you know, to have respect for the family is, a, I think, vital to human beings. And I think systems where it's been tried to, you know, have you know, put children into um, an upbringing, you know, a collective upbringing, you know, we find it in the kibbutz system, you find it in the English preparatory and public school system. I think that, that the family is, is how a society becomes something good and decent because I think that we adopt people as our friends in very much with very much the idea that there are siblings that they become you know you're my sister now we're good friends we are part of a family we we have um you know we will go out of our way to help each other as as we should as people should and that relationship is the foundation of any true and proper civilization mm -hmm. that we treat our friends as family members um and we develop relationships in that way. And what Hubbard did was to replace those family ties, those family loyalties, with a loyalty to him, mm. always yeah. to him. Jerry Armstrong told this incredible story at um, the Toronto Getting Clear conference. Um, I, you know, I thought I knew about Scientology, but there is always something new. Like you telling me about po people being overboarded into human effluent that had come out from other ships. Nobody had ever told me that before. So there's always something new to find out. And Jerry talked about um, his marriage to, would have been Terry Gillum, I presume. Um, and that th there's this picture of, of the wedding and all of the presents, the wedding presents were for Hubbard, you know? Think about that. This, what an ego this man had, that everything, everything had to be focused on him and go towards him. And everybody has to you know, submit to him. And so, you know, the amount of people that I've talked with, hundreds of people over the years, whose families were devastated by Scientology, the amount of people... I remember conversations with a man who's, who was not, had never been involved in Scientology, had no interest in it, but his wife was fervent about Scientology, so he had to pretend. I had another, I had a conversation with some dear friends. Um, they're both of them past now, so Henry uh, Bonchkovsky and his wife, Pamela um, Bonchkowska, I think it goes that way in Polish. Henry, they were, she was a sculptor, he was a painter. They used to rent out rooms to people staying and, and studying at St. Hill in East Grins, near East Grinstead. And I remember sitting down with them. I'd known them for five or six years, considered Henry a good friend. And, you know, I'd left and I was having that conversation with them about, you know, maybe the mother cult's a little bit dangerous. And Henry suddenly went, thank God. I looked at him, he said, when I opened the OT3 pack, which had been, I think, 14 years before for him, I realized that Hubbard was completely mad. But because I love my wife, I decided I'd better not say anything. So for 14 years, he'd not been saying anything. And you know, I'm happy to report that, that you know, Pamela left as well. and. Um, you know, we, we were good friends up, up until her, her, her passing. Um, but this, absolutely no respect whatsoever for the family bond. In fact, a contempt for it. And the, the determination that you know, the person who gets the presents is Ron. <laughs> Can I tell you a little anecdote? Oh, please when do, I, please do. When I used to work at OSA. The Office uh, of Special Affairs. Office of Special Affairs, the branch that handles intelligence, legal, and public relations. I was Heber's assistant. And he was the president of the Church of Scientology, and, and you were his wife. Yeah. 
and we would be invited. Things were a little more gentle in the some parts of the 1980s, mm -hmm. and in the and when there was something like Sea Org Day, which is like August 15th or somewhere thereabouts. No, that's Auditor's Day. Anyway, there's a day in the year which the Sea Org is supposed to be celebrated. And the whole of Osa Int, which was at that time looked on as an int level entity, and were invited to the hierarchy two hours out of Los Angeles near Hammett. Yep. Springs Road. Mm. And I was there, I went up there frequently, and I was there in this particular story talking to Shelley Miscavige. Now, Shelley and I knew each other from the days of the Apollo. Mm. This poor kid and her sister Clarice were dumped there when they were like 12 years old. So they never, ever had a life that a normal teenager would have. Mm -hmm. Never going to a prom, never having a first date of ice cream and ice skating, whatever, nothing, nothing. Mm -hmm. Just Scientology and Hubbard. And her mother had just been found dead a week earlier. So, since Shelley knew me very well from the Apollo, I was talking to her and I said, Clarice, I just want to tell you, I'm so sorry to hear about your mom, Flo. Um, one only ever has one mom, I'm sorry. And Shelley turned around to me and said, fuck that bitch. Don't feel sorry at all. She went to see Mayo and got auditing with the enemy. I tell you, I am giving almost exact wording. I'm not paraphrasing it. Or They're not the kind of words that you would normally use, no, you can Exactly. And using foul language is just, was the culture. And, hmm. and I, I backed off. And then I realized she's never had anything. She's never, there's no love, especially in the hierarchy where it's all, but there's an example of a girl trained by Hubbard, messaging for Hubbard, living under the umbrella of Hubbard, who could give a statement as callous as it was about the death of her mom. We won't get into the whole thing of how the mom died and all this. This is this is this is this is an a show on love, absence of love, and there, the dictator of Scientology, David Miscavige's wife, tossed the aside the death of her mom by the statement she gave. That really. That moment in time froze for me because I saw the mindset. Mm -hmm. There's a story of complete absence of love, absence of compassion, absence of anything. In fact, in Scientology, the drills are to get you to not have feelings, not have case on post not to have emotions. Yeah. There is a whole underlying, you know, you work for the party. You're a company man. Mm. To hell with you having feelings and emotions. That doesn't belong. That doesn't belong in our culture. Mm. Model it. You can talk about it in your counseling session, but we don't want to hear about it. Mm. It's called H-E-N-R. They've human redefined emotion. human emotion and reaction. And it's a derogatory word. I, I, I want to tell you that Hubbard slowly started this indoctrination in his early writings of what he called, 
He denigrated the family unit. He tossed it. He said, that's not you. You don't. It's not you. It's the GE. The genetic, genetic entity. entity. Yeah. Over to you. Over to you. So yeah. The, the, in, he, in he, he read one sentence of how he, he, you see, it was a slow process mm. of parting you with your family by first saying, oh, family, shmamily, genetic entity. Can you give a comment on that? <laughs> yeah, in, in the genetic entity, it, it, there are many weird and wonderful things that have fallen by the wayside because you know, Hubbard had a kind of uh, intellectual diarrhea that, that things, you know, so if, in one of my favorites is, is the demon circuits or the file clerk, you know, these things that we had in 1950 that, that dissipated as time went along. Then he became obsessed with this genetic entity. And this, it, it lives, it's meant to be a creature that lives in, in, in or around the, the stomach, the digestive region. And uh, it, it actually has some interesting parallels, which we won't go into in any depth. One of them is uh, in Chinese philosophy, you have the, what is called the po, which is the bodily soul, which goes back into the, the ground after you die. There are five souls in the body in some Chinese systems. You then have uh, Freud's id, this idea that there's this bestial little creature inside us all. Um, or in the Sufi teachings, you have what is called the nafs or the commanding self, which again is said to be located somewhere in the center of the body. You could then go off into chakras and all sorts of things. It's interesting that people have noticed these things. I didn't actually find out where Hubbard got it from, but there's this idea that there's a genetic line that is to do with your body and then there is you as a spiritual being, you know, and um, somehow floating around. In all of <laughs> and he is saying that he is very much, and, and it's very, I think it's quite astute of you to have seen this, actually, that he is saying that the family means nothing, that your biological connections mean nothing, that the only thing that means anything is to follow and uphold command intention, <laughs> you know. Do yes. what Ron says. Yes. So the the alienation of you with your people actually file lawsuits these days. Alienation of infection. Of, of affection. affection. You can if triangulation that deliberately on purpose made you split up from your family. Hmm. John, I can't even tell you how many. The mother is still working full time in Scientology and the kid is gone. Yeah. And the mother and father just stay there being completely loyal. Um, when I came up, I, I want to, I want to just, I want to keep these just to about an hour because we've got <laughs> speech. We'll be back and we'll explore it further. I want to tell you a story which touched me. When I came out on Marty Rathbone's blog, I literally received 500 email in one evening. Everybody, Karen, Karen, do you remember me? You, you did my power at St. Hill in 1971, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> oh, and one, one email was from a guy who said, Karen, uh, I just wonder if you have any update of my mom and dad. As it turned out, he was offloaded, youngster, dumped at a Greyhound bus station, given $300 and told to get lost. And his mom and dad could just stay loyal to the cult. Now, he named his mom and dad who, actually. <laughs> and his mom, to this day, I believe, works on free wins. She's in CMO, an absolute. Mm -hmm. She's like a Genghis Khan of females, a terrorist who frightens people with threats and lives. Anyway, she's happy her, exerting her power on free wins. And... And so this email touched me because he was begging to know. He said, 
they don't even know they have a grandchild. And he, he was trying to find out if there's anything he could do to re... He was tossed out like a piece of garbage, but the parents didn't. Parents didn't care. Same thing happened with Darius Wilhair. You know, Greg Wilhair is the execution of buddy, buddy, buddy with David Miscavige. His kid was ordered off as a suppressive person and Sandy and Craig treat the mother church as their be all and end all. Mm -hmm. There's case history after case, hundreds of cases mm -hmm. where Scientology has split the family, thrown out the child or thrown out the father or mother. By thrown out, I mean, Declared SP. A declaration oh. of SP is it's an oppressive person, an anti social person, personality. anybody who complains about Scientology or Hubbard. Yeah, that's, that's so, you know, there's no <laughs> come on, man is basically good and they supposedly have all the technology. Da, 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 da. No. So, if you want to risk your family being split up, walk in the door of Scientology. Right. Because sooner or later. But curiously, <laughs> yeah, but after I got involved in Scientology, I was 19, and <laughs> um, my mum would have been, what, 57 at that time. And um, she was a fairly eminent member of the Conservative Party locally. Oh. And she'd been a town councillor and this kind of stuff. And um, she was wonderful. She's lovely, my mum. But to see if I was going to get into any trouble, and she knew that I usually did, without telling me, she went along to the Scientology mission in Birmingham and did a course. And um, she liked it and she stayed. And so for eight years, she was in Scientology. And the reason that she left was that a rumour had travelled up to Birmingham that I was asking questions and uh, she was on a course one day with a, a dear friend of hers. Um, and the friend said, what will you do if John is declared suppressive? Mm. My mum left Scientology at that moment. She said, I, that is what a ridiculous idea. The idea that I would stop loving and caring for my own child because of some edict from Scientology, and yet you and I have both seen it. Yeah. And, and for me, if you desert your children, mm. then you have committed the greatest of offences. You know, yeah. that I have four children. I'm extraordinarily lucky in, in, in that regard. I cannot imagine. You know, I can remember when I was in St. Petersburg, I gave a talk in St. Petersburg, which was great in 2014, and there were several they have a huge Jehovah's Witness community there, huge. And so they have a lot of ex-Jehovah's Witnesses as well. And the chap was um, helping me with a PowerPoint show and told me about his family. He was 35 years old, I think. And his parents hadn't talked to him for three or four years. And I still, it, it shocks me. I've seen it enough times. Yes, children not talking to their parents, I understand that, you know, but parents not talking to their children, that is a cardinal sin. You know, in, in, in my cosmos, you go, you go to hell if you do that. Uh, you, you're definitely not allowed to do that. Hubbard, absolute contempt for the family, uh, his own family, anybody else's family, didn't matter to him at all. Uh, all he wanted to do was breed narcissists who could follow him devotedly and believe their existence dependent upon him, which, of course, as I think we've demonstrated by our time away from the group, uh, our existence doesn't depend upon Scientology. And uh, it is possible to uh, find the way to happiness outside of Scientology. It is not possible to find the way to happiness inside Scientology. It will make you miserable. So don't do it. Yep, yep. In fact, if you've got too much money, put some of it into my Patreon account. Please do. Just chip in a, a, a form, a, 
An action like this on YouTube is completely fan supported. There is no paycheck. Uh, John's assistant Spike is marginally living and your support would mean so much. So please do it. Yes. John and I have a very, very exciting next show. So come back to us and we'll see you in a month's time. Thank you, John. I'm, I'm still just thrilled that Eaton, the aristocratic college of colleges, yeah. invited you as an honored guest to enlighten them on Scientology. Did he? And yep. that I'm going to take away as the win of the month, the win of the year. <laughs> John, love you lots. Love you take too. Care. Thanks take so care. much. See you. Bye bye. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like, as well as subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. We can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much.